Um, good morning. You braved the cold. You braved the Super Bowl day. Come on, here we are. Okay. Um, I think the Lord has something special for us today. So let's say, why don't you say with me, Lord Jesus, will you form me? Will you speak to me? Will you shape me? And will you fill me? Amen. Okay, I am in Acts 4. We are journeying through the book of Acts. Um, we were, uh, Pastor Daniel and I were actually down at a conference this past week about the Iranian church. That's the church in the country of, anybody know? <laughs> Iran. I, it's amazing. I'll talk a little bit about it today perhaps. But that is the fastest growing, arguably the fastest growing church in the world. Isn't that interesting? In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if in... 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road that uh, either the country of Iran or the country of China or the country of India, the top three fastest growing churches in the entire globe, um, and by that I mean they're coming to Christ at a greater rate, churches are being planted faster, um, there is an absolute like renewal and revival of people happening, uh, turning away from things like Islam to Jesus. It's, it's amazing. But it wouldn't even surprise me if in some years they begin to send, they, non-Americans, begin Begin to send missionaries. Woo! Oh my goodness, Lord Jesus. Okay, we'll just let that one sit. All right, I am in Acts 4. Uh, we are going through the book of Acts. If you've not joined us before, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, we are perhaps unusual, but we take the word, and I'm going to attempt to open it up and allow the Holy Spirit to breathe life into it. And I am convinced that the Christian life is not about changing your behavior or modifying how you look or sound or what you say or how you say it, but rather about King Jesus to transform your heart. And I'm convinced that when the Lord Jesus transforms our heart, in worship, in the word, in daily life, even in suffering and difficulty, that what happens is King Jesus is formed and planted within us, and then what comes out of us? King Jesus. That's right. So that's what we're going to look at uh, this morning in Acts chapter 4. And let me just say, uh, is Pedro in the room? Pedro, are you in the room somewhere? No? Pedro, there he is. It, I, it's awfully cold up here. Um, maybe the boilers are off. I checked this. That one's still on. So maybe just check the boilers. And if nothing we can do about it, nothing we can do about it. I heard it was cold last week, too. Bring your jacket. Okay, I'm sorry. We're in a middle school. Welcome. <laughs> Jesus is Lord here, too. Okay, so I am in Acts 4. Um, I, wanted, I want to do two things. I just want to set this up. Um, so historically, I would say to you that um, as we move into Acts 4, we experience the death of Christ a few chapters before. Um, we've experienced the resurrection of Christ three days after he died. We experienced his ascension or coronation, as we called it, where he ascended back to heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. Um, that was about uh, 40 days after he uh, rose um, from the dead. And then nine or ten days after that, we've experienced Pentecost, where the church is filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's the first time where God doesn't just hover over his people, but rather he comes into his people. Um, so likely, as we begin this Acts chapter 4, we're about two months out from the death of Jesus, give or take, okay? Just to put you in a timeline context. So, um, let's uh, even create an emotional feeling around that. If they had taken one of us, they being the authorities, the government that ruled us, had taken one of us and had uh, beat us until there was no uh, skin on our back um, and then pounded uh, nails through our wrists and our feet and hung us on a pole outside for all of us to see 60 days ago, would you remember it? Would there be anything else you were thinking about the moment your eyes fluttered open? Probably not. I mean, I, so, so just get in context that this is what is ruminating through people. This is like reverberating through this New Testament church. And we've already seen it go from a mere 120 believers in an upper room. 3,000 more people came to faith. And what we're getting ready to read here is that 2,000 additional people. So suddenly, the, the radical expansion of the kingdom of God has gone from 120 to 3,120. It's about to go to 5,120, give or take. Yeah? Okay, 
Here we go. Now, the other thing that I think you need to understand here is if we stepped back and took a 30 or 40,000 foot viewpoint um, from the New Testament church, here's what I would probably say. I believe in reading history that the God of heaven was waiting and planning as to when he would send King Jesus to arrive on planet Earth. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, if, if Rome had not conquered the existing and known world, then word could not have traveled very quickly. And then Rome did this other thing that was pretty amazing. They built roads so that their massive armies could run up and down the roads and conquer more people, right? And they also built roads uh, so that they could um, continue to succeed in their super wealthy salt trade, right? And isn't it interesting that the actual gospel of Christ Jesus was carried up and down those Roman roads, built to conquer people, and built to transport salt, right? So that the original um, gospel of Jesus is going up and down those Roman roads. And then God waited until Greek, uh, or Greece, excuse me, was conquered, and the Romans began to discover this beautiful language called... Uh, Greek, that's right, and, and, and when they adopted that language as their own, I think God sovereignly saw fit to go, now that the earth has been unified under, albeit an evil rule, let's say, of Rome, and they're being unified under the language of Greek, I am going to release Jesus to come and to minister the gospel of Christ Jesus because now a man and then a group of men and women that gather around that man Jesus can actually go forth and, and the gospel can spread and scatter across the face of the earth. Would it have been the same 100 years prior? No. Fascinating. The God of heaven saw fit to do it now in, in, in Acts 4. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dig in. Let's start reading. I'm going to pick up in verse 1. Um, just the other quick reminder is Peter has just walked into the temple called the Gate Beautiful. Peter's walking with a buddy of his named, anybody remember? John, that's right. John the Beloved is how he identifies himself in the book of John. Um, and they were two of Peter's, or two of Jesus' closest friends, closest disciples. And I want you to pay attention to that because that's going to be very important as we go on. But they're passing a, a, a person who was begging, which is the Jewish, Jewish version of a welfare system at the time. He's begging at a gate to the temple. They pass by this guy and he says, hey, give me silver or gold. And Peter famously says, silver and gold I have None, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Come on, y'all say that together. Walk. Okay, so immediately his feet and ankles become strong and he stands to his feet. And then he is like dancing and shouting and praising God and making a huge commotion in this high holy temple where you're not supposed to make a commotion. It's like being in church. Shh. And he's making a commotion, and when he makes a commotion, this huge crowd, thousands of people gathered, and all of a sudden, Peter steps up, who betrayed Jesus not 60 days prior, right? Total failure, total shame. He steps up, he preaches this sermon, and now let's pick up in the middle of the sermon in Acts chapter 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So put that in modern vernacular. Who came up to Peter and John? Come on, y'all can do this with me. Who came up to Peter and John? If Jesus walked in today, or let's say Peter and John walked in today and they're preaching, and the temple guard and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the priests and all these people came up and surrounded Peter and John, who surrounded them? Pastors, church people, religious people. You hear what I'm saying? So suddenly, uh, you have this religious gathering, and I think you have to, if you've never listened to us or, or been with us, whether online or in person, I think you have to make a very strong parallel between the Old Testament Pharisees and Sadducees and New Testament preachers and leaders and pastors and shepherds, okay? So that is who suddenly is gathering around Peter. Now, you would think that they're going to gather around Peter and John and they're going to be like for it. Like, yay, Peter and John, come on. Let's launch King Jesus. Let's launch the ministry. Let's preach the gospel. But let's see what happens. Verse 2. While they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Who rose from the dead? Now, I want you to hold something as we journey through this passage. If 
the Pharisees and Sadducees could have produced the body of Jesus, the literal corpse of Jesus, what would have happened to Christianity? That's all they would have had to do. That's it. It all would have ended right there. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Verse 3, they seized Peter and John. This is like aggressively. They laid hands on them. They drugged them. Now the moment these religious people, these pastors and leaders, lay hands on Peter and John, what are Peter and John thinking? We are going to die. That's exactly right. We are going to die. It is over. <laughs> Like, that's what's going through their brain. I guarantee it. I can't, like, get in fully into their head or scripture. But when I look at this and I put it in context, no doubt, do they have tightness in their chests? Probably. Do they have anxiety rising within them? Probably. Are they beginning to get defensive or scared that someone's going to actually drag them out the Golgotha to Calvary, which is 500 yards from where they're standing, and kill them? Yes. So, so all of these human emotions, and we like to like read the scripture and go, well, surely they're not normal people. No, I assure you, they are normal. And they are feeling what you and I would be feeling. And if somebody marched in here today and laid hands on me and drug my hide out there and told me they were going to kill me, what am I going to be feeling? <gasps> yeah? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, verse 3, they seized or laid hands on Peter and John in the Greek, and because it was evening, they did what? Put them in jail until the next day. Verse 4, but many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to 5,000. Now this is in a day and age where they don't always count women, so it, you could actually go there was even more believers than 5,000 at this point if you count women and children. But I want you to begin to notice something. Is the persecution stopping the growth and expansion of the kingdom of God through the local church? No. What is it actually doing? And it's amazing to me, like amazing to me, even sitting, Pastor and Daniel and I are sitting at this conference this last week, and I'm listening to Iranian after Iranian, per, that means person from Iran, who was born and raised in a Muslim setting, and they're talking about uh, how they grew up as a Muslim, and they had some encounter with the God of the Bible, and they've given their lives, they've surrendered their lives to this Jesus, and they're talking about house churches and people that meet in secrecy, and they're talking about smuggling Bibles over the border into Iran and it is like th this group of people cannot get their hands fast enough on the scriptures they can't print them fast enough they can't get them over the border fast enough and they can't control the growth of the church even though it is illegal to be a Christian in Iran it's amazing I actually got to sit with a guy who uh, spent five years in prison uh, for his faith in Iran lost his wife lost his kids lost his extended family lost everything and he's sitting there in front of me with the joy of the Lord and this big smile on his face. And he's counted it all as loss compared to knowing King Jesus. And I am like humbled like, and here we are in America. And the comfort of our lives and the comfort of our situation has bred deadness in our hearts and an apathy and a lack of hunger. And I will stand at the front of the conga line. And I'm amazed at what happens when the church is persecuted. Now, let me flip this and make a common or modern um, analogy. There's many Christians right now who are wringing their hands and really worried because they feel like we are losing Jesus in this country. May we be? Yeah. Is God wringing his hands? No. And I assure you, as we drift from being a God-centered or God-aware nation or group of people that in the uh, rising, perhaps, persecution or dislike that you will actually, as things get more and more difficult, you will see the church begin to grow and expand. And all of a sudden, we as people will have to go, am I really a Christian or do I just walk away from all this? Is Jesus real? Is he really the king? And you're faced with this decision. And when you make that decision at that level, all of a sudden, it is transformative. Let's keep going. Verse 5. The next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law 
What's the law? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, it's the Mosaic Law. It's the Torah, it's those five books. The Mosaic Law would be mostly in Leviticus, but the Mosaic Law. So the teachers of the law. So that means that's their Old Testament Bible. So the, the teachers of the Old Testament. Michael's a teacher of the Bible. Okay, but, but new and the old. Okay, so all of these religious people gather around them. Um, and now verse 6. Annas, the high priest, was there. Does anyone remember reading Annas' name in the last few months that we've been preaching through John and the next? Come on. Who's Annas? What did Annas do? Anyone? He presided over the trial of Jesus, and he sentenced Jesus ultimately to death. The high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas. Caiaphas um, was Annas' father-in-law. There's a whole story there. John, Alexander's, and the others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. Now, here's what we know just very, very quickly. Um, this is the court of the Sanhedrin, okay? The great Sanhedrin is what they would have said. There's probably 71 of them. They're probably gathered um, off a little building off of the temple in the very center of Jerusalem. And this is like their supreme court, okay? This is no joke. So when the Sanhedrin meets, now, you got to keep in mind they're, they're ruled at some level by Herod, um, the king. Then they're ruled, Herod's ruled by Rome. So they've been taken over by Rome. But they have a lot of power and authority over the Jewish people under, the, under Herod, the king, and then under Roman rule. Does that make sense? So this would be the high, the, um, the, 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 the um, I guess, um, uh, supreme court or the highest court in the land that would decide everything. So suddenly um, they brought them in. So Peter and John are where? In jail. They're brought out of jail. Clink, clink, bars open, whatever. They drag them. Do you think they're treating them well? I assure you they're not. Is it possible someone's been hit or beaten? Absolutely. If they don't like something they say or do, what are they doing? Letting them know. So they're dragging them in, and they, drink, they bring them in uh, and begin to question them. Sanhedrin, here's what they say. By what power or name do you do this? Now, do what? What have they done? Context. They've just walked into the temple. What was the guy doing at the temple? Sitting there, broken. He, had, he couldn't use his legs from birth. Um, and all of a sudden, they... Healed him. So the Sanhedrin is saying to them, by what power or what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, rulers and elders of the people. I love how respectful he is in the middle of being disrespected. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed... I love the logic here. Are we being called in here because we healed somebody? Because there was a guy who was broken and couldn't get up and now he can? So we've been thrown in jail. We've potentially been beaten. We're being now harassed because we did an act of kindness. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 10. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now, a couple of things that I think you need to immediately understand here. New Testament church. Oh, Father, help us as we try to get this in context and, and understand it. Um, if God reveals his heart, so he demonstrates his heart, he illustrates his heart, he communicates his heart, not just through Jesus, but through the people Jesus pick and the identity and even the ethnicity of Jesus. Okay, you follow me? Could Jesus have been born in the home of Caesar in Rome? Yeah. Could Jesus have been born into a powerful family? Yes. Could Jesus have been born into the aristocracy of the Jews and been actually in the court of the Sanhedrin? 
Yes, but instead, God has Jesus come as a babe, totally helpless, uh, totally, I mean, frail and able to be totally broken, born into the home of a peasant man and woman, Mary and Joseph, and then raised as a carpenter or a stonemason in the most disrespected city in the nation of Israel called... Now, you've got to begin to get something about the heart of God. If he chooses a nation that is being conquered and ruled, it is enslaved, it is abused, it is hurt, it is harassed, it is ruled. And if he chooses someone who is least in the least city, in the least part of the nation, least powerful, um, least beautiful, least glorious, what does that begin to say to you about the heart of this God? You hear me? He didn't pick the most beautiful, the most right, the most whatever you want to say. He picked the very lowliest, okay? Now, <clears throat> this next part is, is powerful. I want to, before I read verse 11, I want to go back to verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a theology here that I want to just touch on, and you can hang on to it. You can search it out if you want. But there's a theology of the active infilling. It doesn't say, then Peter, who used to be filled with the Holy Spirit, does it? It doesn't say Peter, who would eventually be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says Peter, who is active, present, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's something powerful about the Christian life as you're beginning to recognize Christ formed in you that it's not just a one-time event where you come and say, Jesus, would you forgive me? And you pray this idea of the sinner's prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't disagree theologically with praying a sinner's prayer. But there can be this idea that you don't fully envelop and recognize that this is an active, um, I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. I was filled with the Spirit, I'm being filled with the Spirit, and I will be filled with the Spirit. So hypothetically, is it possible for one of us as Christians to give our life to Jesus, but then sort of take it back and do it our way? Yes. Is it also possible for us to live a sort of nominal Christian life, sort of not caring about the infilling power of the Spirit, and just drift by and do whatever we want? Yes. But what this demonstrates to me is Peter is actively surrendering his heart, exchanging his heart of stone, if you will, for a heart of flesh, exchanging his brokenness for the life of Christ in him and through him. And Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to talk about Peter and John in just a minute, but let's keep going down in verse 11. I mean, was Peter shy about this? I mean, he's sitting in court, like he's in chains. He's probably chained up. He's at the defendant's, you know, bench, which would have been right here. He's got the huge Sanhedrin court gathered around, probably in a big horseshoe shape right here. And Peter, I mean, he is thinking of what just happened two months prior. Jesus was killed less than 500 yards from where he sits. Less than 500 yards. What's he thinking is going to happen to him? I'm going to die today is what he's thinking. I can almost guarantee it. I can't wait to look him in the eyes in heaven and ask him. What were you thinking when you stood up and said, then know this, you and all the people of Israel is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. So what's amazing, and you're going to begin to see it even more as we go along, but you have this high-powered Sanhedrin judging Peter sitting right here, right? And then all of a the sudden, there's this huge sort of cataclysmic shift where all of a sudden Peter and John are no longer on trial, but Peter and John are almost sitting in the seat of the judges, and the Sanhedrin are now the ones under the weight of their own judgment. Fascinating. This man stands before you healed. Verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone or the chief cornerstone. Now, I wish we had time today. We do not. Um, but Peter is actually quoting two things here. Number one, I think he's quoting uh, Jesus in Matthew 21. You got to read it. Write it down in your notes or whatever, wherever you're typing or whatever. Matthew 21 and actually read um, how, G how Peter is quoting Jesus. But Peter is quoting Jesus who's quoting Psalms 118 verse 22. 
I love this because there is never a, there's never like a divorce or separation from the God of the old and the God of the new. He always fulfills the old and creates the new. And, and so there's this like beautiful full orbed picture that begins to emerge. But, but who are the builders being mentioned here? Who are the builders? All right, so remember, we're sitting in this big horseshoe-shaped group, Sanhedrin. They're the high supreme court in the land. Who are the builders? Them. So he looks at them and he says, the stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the chief cornerstone. And if I just gave you a quick snapshot of that, and maybe next week we'll even go back and look at Matthew 21 because it is so powerful. But this image comes from these ancient stone quarries. When they, in, in Israel, there's not many trees. Anybody been to Israel? So even when it says Jesus was a... Um, was a carpenter, I think that's an Americanism, because the word's tecton, and I think it means more if he was a stonemason, because what's there a lot of in Israel? Stones. Okay, so stonemasons would carefully choose um, the cornerstone, and that cornerstone became most important because the entire structure was pulled off the sto- that stone. You follow me? I, I just built this um, little playhouse thing for our kids over Christmas, and I got my cornerstone wrong. I'm not a great carpenter, I realized. And guess what? Guess my, so it was just this little simple like pad, a a, a wood like thing, wood deck that we put a little playhouse on. And it's just like 12 feet by 10 feet. There's nothing to it. But I I put four by fours in the ground and I got my, I got my corner wrong. So what happened to the whole structure? Everything was wrong. I'm like, how did this happen? This is wrong, and I'm kind of frustrated. I'm like, oh my goodness! Then I got to cut this board different. Now I got to cut this board different. Now I got to—I mean, the whole thing. Great job, Michael. I should have called Daniel Bennett. He's our worship leader and a great carpenter. <clears throat> um, so, but, but here's the point: the cornerstone is of such vital importance, and Peter's actually saying God sent the chief corner, cornerstone to fulfill the entire Old uh, Testament, Old Covenant, and introduce the New. And you all, instead of recognizing Him as King Jesus and Messiah and Savior to the world, rejected Him. And not only did you reject Him and hate Him because He didn't look like and sound like and and have the ancestral that you thought He should have and therefore you put him to death okay if you want to cross-reference both of those again it's psalm 118 22 and it's matthew 21 um, especially verse 42 verse 12 salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved So he's standing up in this Supreme Court and he's going, all of y'all are wrong. Your performance. And if you look at Matthew 21, it is unbelievable. It is a scathing rebuke. And what's amazing to me is Jesus always reserves his harshest criticism, uh, not for people who are broken and lost in sin, but for the religious folks who are arrogant and self-righteous and think they have it together and are super judgmental and ugly towards the people that they think don't. You hear me? God is not sitting in heaven uh, judging most harshly um, people who are struggling with financial sin or even sexual sin or sexual identity confusion. Or We can go on and on and on. We can, just, we can fill up the room with things that the church says, people who've had abortions or people who are in illicit relationships or people who are having affairs. We could go on and on and judge, right? And the church has gotten so good at judging people out there. And what Jesus actually came to institute is, listen to me. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. The problem is in here. And I'm afraid that one day we're actually going to stand as we cross into eternity and there's going to be crowds of people. This is purely Michael Mattis conjecture. It is not in scripture. This is my belief. But I think the hordes at some level as we cross over into eternity and stand before King Jesus will actually yell at and probably throw stones at pastors for not telling them the truth. The problem is in our own hearts. Our hearts are sick and we must be made new in Christ Jesus. 
And so God is here now, now just like uh, Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for the pastors and the leaders and the churches that were self-righteous and super judgy towards everybody outside. He's reserved, and now Peter has reserved his harshest criticism also for the people who are taking this self-righteous high position. Make sense? You go, well, where is it safe, Michael? Let me show you, like this. Evie sitting on the front row right here. Why did I go sit next to her? Maybe you didn't see that. I went and knelt right next to Evie and we just prayed. Because this is an external position that illustrates a heart posture before King Jesus. It is a position of humility. It is a position of, God, would you have your way with me? It is an open-handed. It is, I am surrendering my life to your control. And that's what Peter has done to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit like he is in this moment. How did Peter overcome his fear right here? Was he scared? Absolutely. I bet he was terrified. I bet his chest was tight and his head was pounding and he was, oh! and he got up and did it. He appropriated the fullness of Christ Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Now you've got to see this. This is so powerful. Verse 13. When they saw the courage, who's they? All the religious people, okay, that are perfect and have everything together. And When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. King Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the universe, God of the angel armies, the bookends of time existed before the earth began and will exist after the earth ceases to exist, comes to planet earth. And he picks two of his three closest friends and he chooses who? Peter and John. So the king of glory, the king of heaven and earth, the one who created all, could be friends with any person on the planet. And who does he choose? Unschooled. Come on, what's my other word? Ordinary. I don't know about you, but I feel ordinary. Most days when I get up here, I sit on the front row and my knees knock a little bit and I go, oh my goodness, I got to get up there and preach Jesus. Lord, I feel ordinary. Lord, I feel, un I was sitting there this morning trying to worship Jesus and there was a fact that was running through my brain and I was like, I don't know if I have that right. I was feeling and unschooled. And I sat there thinking, good gracious, I'm getting ready to preach this and this is what's going through my head. And, and I couldn't help but notice my own insecurity. And I want you to see something about the power and presence of Jesus. This Jesus sought the world over. And he could have been friends with any people. And two that he picked of his twelve were Peter, who was a loudmouth, bombastic, kind of arrogant, probably punk of a fisherman. And then this guy named John, who was probably soft-spoken and totally the opposite of Peter. He picked people who were ordinary and unschooled. And I want you to see something, if you see anything today. It's if you came in these doors or you're watching online and you would go, I feel unschooled, I feel ordinary, I feel silly, I feel insecure. You fill in the blank. I have got news for you that the God of heaven is not looking for pompous, self-righteous people who have their mess together and are going to go around looking around their nose at people who don't. He is looking for people who will actually go, Lord Jesus, out of my I lack, would your perfection be made perfect in and through my weakness and my brokenness? It is not some great wealthy or wild person or some successful person or beautiful person or, you know, time's most influential person of the year or most beautiful person of the year that Jesus picked to proclaim his gospel. No, 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 no. He picked the foolish things, the silly things, the mundane things to confound the Sanhedrin. If you came in here this morning feeling ordinary, insignificant, insecure, 
unschooled, I have got news for you that the power of God is closer to you than you think. And the kingdom of God is closer to you than you think. And if you will begin to surrender your heart and lives to him, he will fill and work in and through. It is not the religious ones. It is not the ones who have it together out here that he is going to commend. It's the ones who are willing to exchange their brokenness for the righteousness of Christ. Now, I want to take this one step further. If I did a little exercise with us and said, okay, church, I want you to sit quietly in your seat, and I want you to think of your greatest weakness. I want you to think of your greatest flaw. I want you to think of your greatest failure. And then I want you to envision Jesus taking that greatest weakness and filling it with his power and his grace and his redemptive work and the life of Christ in it and the life of Christ through it and him driving your shame away and him driving your insecurity away and him driving your feeling like lack or less than or like a victim or like a second class citizen and all of a sudden the strength and righteousness of Christ shines up and rises in and through that biggest broken hurt area and all of a sudden what you thought was your greatest weakness under the power and influence of surrendering it to King Jesus becomes the very platform from which you minister. That's the gospel. That's how God works. He takes people like Peter, unschooled, ordinary fishermen, and he takes them through a journey, and Peter willing to surrender it all before King Jesus now astonishes the Sanhedrin, and he preaches the gospel. The second thing I want you to see in verse 13, they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled ordinary men and they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with, how do you get life transformation? How do you get it? Let's go back. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is why I'm always talking about a five-year journal, about some daily declarations to remind Michael of who Michael is. Uh, you, you have to, we have to uh, really appropriate almost daily this relationship with King Jesus. I believe from Genesis to Revelation, God is this fiercely relational God that is always inviting and beckoning us into deeper surrender and relationship with him. And as we're faithful to surrender our hearts to him, he will use us, work through us, and express his glory in and through us in the earth. That's the heart of God. Let's keep going. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Can you imagine this group of religious people being totally silenced? Nothing. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin. So they took them out of the courtroom. So they had people pick them up, guards. They escort them out of the courtroom. And then they conferred together. This is like the, um, this is like the Supreme Court going into closed session. They close the doors. They turn off the cameras. Nobody can hear anything. And they get up and they have this big argument amongst themselves. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign. What's the sign? The healing of the sick man. And we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Whose name? Now, I want you to think of something, and this is like dips into some apologetics and whatever, but it's so powerful to me. If the Sanhedrin could have produced the dead corpse of Jesus, would this have all gone away? Like immediately, guys. Like, the entirety of Christianity would have died right there, like a million other uh, human-led movements. They could have shut this entire thing down, and yet, there was no body because Jesus had risen and revealed himself to 500 people. But to stop this 
<clears throat> from spreading any further. We must tell them not to speak any longer in this name. Verse 18, they called them in again. Who's them? Peter and John, that's right, and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I wonder what was on Peter and John's face right there. You may not speak at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? What courage. This is Peter who 60 days ago when the little slave girl said, aren't you with him? And Peter ran and... I mean, hid. He ran and hid. He, this is Peter that denied Christ. And he stands up and says, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, what is he saying? Kill me if you must. But if you let me go, I will preach Jesus. After further threats, they let them go, and they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Your unschooled, ordinary, insecure, broken, lack of courageous self in the hands of the Creator, King Jesus, becomes extraordinary. That's the message. The next time the enemy or your stray thoughts or whatever it is comes to remind you how ordinary you are. Here's my one little key. It's my one little application point. He reminds me how ordinary I am every single day. And you know what I've learned? It's really profound. Are you ready? Get ready. I agree. I go, I am. I'm a 42-year-old bald man that runs a landscaping company and pastors a little church. I am ordinary. But when King Jesus comes and takes over my ordinary, it becomes extraordinary. Every single one of us who are in Jesus, that's the way he's called us to live. It's not self-aggrandizement. It's recognizing and agreeing that you and I without him are absolutely Nothing. Father, I pray that as we bring this gathering to a close, that you would seal deep in our hearts that a relationship with you is not just about a church gathering. It's about walking with you, abiding in you, allowing Christ Jesus to be formed in us. And Father, I pray across this church and even those online, that we would be a group that is filled with the power and presence of the Spirit of Jesus.